put off by how long this video is, don't worry. I tend to jam-pack my videos with as much content, as many details as I possibly can, and I try to talk pretty fast. So while the video is a bit on the long side, I don't repeat myself, and I get into a lot of details about the subject that, you know, pretty much anything that I feel I can comment on and that I think you might find interesting. But hey, if the video is just too long for you to watch, chances are I recorded a shorter version, and the link will be in the description box. It's not an inferior video, it's merely a Cliff's Notes version of this very video. Since Creed Revelations game review. It does somewhat live up to that title. It certainly does provide some answers, but it also asks new questions and yeah, apparently, apparently part of the creed of everything is permitted and you know that apparently does include stringing along audiences. And both single player and multiplayer gives you know, some answers with single player the focus being on the assassins and multiplayer being placed on the Templars, whom we still don't learn enough about, but at least they do fill some in. Anyway, following the ending of Brotherhood, which I won't be spoiling, Desmond is in a coma, and apparently when you're in a coma and you've been in the Animus for a long time, you wake up in the limbo from inception. I don't know, I guess they just wanted to go for, you know, ripping off every movie that this seemed, you know, similar to. It's not enough that the animus looks exactly like the, you know, cherry jack into in the Matrix. Now, the... Yes, he, he meets Subject 16, who is very distraught. I think it's because he looks like, you know, a combination of Jake Busey and Jack Nicholson's Joker. Anyway, he tells him that the only way he can be sure to survive is, or for his mind to survive, is to experience the remaining memories of, you know, the I think he basically mainly means Ezio, but you do also get to experience some memories of Alter. You're more on that later. And, you know, because apparently if the mind has already experienced these memories, then when it collapses, they won't be new to him. Whatever, I'll buy it. It brings Ezio to Constantinople in 1511, I think is when the game starts. And he, you know, comes to a city which already has an Assassin's Guild led by Yusuf, who's, you know, quite charming at, at times. A great new character, you know, several great new characters, really. And, yeah, he has to help out with some of the problems that they have. And, you know, along the way he'll meet Prince Suleiman, you get to fight Janissaries, you know, all that cool stuff that, you know, we're used to in this series. This change of location is a bit off-putting, not because it's not a really grand locale, but because Ezio feels really out of place in it. I think it might have been smart if they had just, you know, made it be another of Desmond's ancestors. But anyway, the game does bring closure to Ezio's character and also to Altair. And you know, both of them, it's fairly satisfactory. Altair, basically there are these five keys. You know, the game starts with Ezio exploring Masyaf, you know, the castle from the first one. And it's very delicately recreated, so, you know, if you love the first one, then it's a real treat. And he finds this big door, which the Templars, who are, you know, there, they've taken it over, they can't quite seem to get through. And apparently there are these five keys that are required 
to open this door. And Ezio goes to look for these five keys, and that brings him brings him to Constantinople. And over the course of the game, you of course retrieve these five keys. And every time you get one, it you know, as it turns out, Altair was a bit of a vlogger himself. He recorded memories of his own onto these keys that were to communicate things to, you know, the assassin who found them, which, you know, wound up being Ezio, and thus you get to play. And, you know, it, it gives some really nice answers, you know. After playing the first game, I was really wondering what happened with Altair after all that, and this game answers that. And, yeah, in general, you, you get to play him through different periods of his life and, you know, follow the, the events that, you know, happened with his order, his, or his time in the order. The graphics have gotten an upgrade, you know, obviously, otherwise not much has really happened. The, with that, the, the overall, you know, tone and approach are about the same. The streamlining continues and continues to be excessive. This doesn't really undo, I don't think, any of the balancing, you know, dialing back of the streamlining that Brotherhood did, but I don't think it's quite as well, well balanced as Brotherhood. And I'm gonna have to say, Brotherhood remains the best game of the series so far. You know, I'm hoping the third one will top it. But yeah, this this just doesn't quite reach the level of quality which Brotherhood set as you know for for the rest of the, these. For a while, this appears to have. You know, th this seems like they just used up all their good ideas for big action set pieces in Brotherhood, but in reality, they just spread them out and integrated almost all of them into the main storyline, which is arguably better than Brotherhood. Also, the assassins are actually... It, it, they're like a photo negative of how they are in Brotherhood. In Brotherhood, sending them on, you know, missions to other cities and such doesn't really matter that much, whereas here you actually take over those other cities, you know, bring them to, you know, bring them from Templar control into Assassin control. And over time, there, you know, there's this counter that says, you know, so and so much, so and so many percent control of this city, and it'll either say Templar or Assassin, depending on if you've you know, taken over that city, and all of them start under Templar control, of course, and you have to, uh, although unfortunately that, you know, the tunnel network is already completed, which, I don't know, I, I thought it was fun in Brotherhood to actually, you know, complete it and be able to travel faster. Also, there are no horses in this. They, or at most they're like, you know, I mean, there are horse-drawn carriages, but you don't ride it yourself, except for these horse-drawn carriages. Anyway, the other half of the photo negative, where in Brotherhood, training them to be, you know, to be at the top took a while, and you really felt like, you know, I, I am training these guys, you know, I'm, it's it's the Rocky thing, you know, it just, you know, it, it almost has the, the 80s montage and everything, just, it takes time, and you feel like you're, you're making progress. In this, they just, you know, instantly become master assassins. I don't know, I guess the guild is just that good at training them. I mean, they sure did train Altair and Ezio to be nearly invulnerable. Or, you know, impossible to defeat anyway. Now, with that said, in this, training them to the top level actually matters more than it would. In Brotherhood, it doesn't particularly matter. It's kind of just, you know, hey, I can do this, and, you know, oh, you can operate them, and that remains. But, in this, you have different, you know, yeah, you, you have assassin dens, which I guess you kind of did in Brotherhood, but the, they can be attacked by the Templars. There really is, this really feels like there is a civil war going on. You know, it has a more, yeah, it has more consequence in that, 
you know, regard, which is really nice. Something that the series desperately lacks. And yeah, they, they can, all of these dens, except for the main hideout, can be attacked. And by the way, something I should say as well. The dens don't start out being dens. They start out being, or they start out being controlled by the Templars, and you have to do the same thing as in Brotherhood. You know, take out the Templar captain, and then go out. Here, you just don't blow up the tower. You just light a signal, and it just kind of tells the the Templar soldiers, "Ah, oh, okay, and move on to the next one." You know, time's up here, and yeah, then it becomes an assassin den. And if you reach the full level, you know, at the, the awareness level, the Templar awareness, which has been there in all the games, but before it was just that, oh, they'll, you know, know you, they'll spot you on sight, and, I don't know, that, that's fine, basically, but it is a little, I mean, still, you can just escape very easily, not to mention, fight them off really easily, no matter how many of them attack you. You know, no matter how many of them attack you at a time. Although this does a better job. The Janissaries that I mentioned before, they carry guns, and they're not afraid of using them either. You know, so if you fight several of those, they're, they're pretty badass, seriously. And usually you, you don't get to kill them with just one hit either. It's, you know, it takes several, I think it takes like three hits, you know. Anyway, these dens, you, once you take them over, you know, they are under your control, but they can be attacked if your Templar Awareness goes to the top level. But if you train your assassins to the top level, then you can assign them as the captain of a den, which protects it from, you know, being attacked. If you don't have all of your dens protected by these, you know, assassin captains, and you reach full Templar Awareness, 100%, which is, it's more difficult to bring down, there are fewer options, you know, there are no posters to tear down, and the other two options, you know, killing witnesses, bribing heralds, they give half, about half, I think, of the effect that they used to, and even restoring buildings increases your, their awareness of you, so, you know, be careful, you know, restore a couple of shops, and suddenly they're, they're on you, you know. If you reach 100% Templar Awareness, and then you do something, I don't remember, heinous, is that the word? That you, if, if you do something really big, you know, then they're going to attack one of your dens, and then you can run to the den and engage in den defense, which is unique to this game in the series. Basically, you know, some people are going to like it, some people aren't. It's basically a real-time strategy kind of thing in third person. You're, you're static, you have to remain in place, but you can, you know, use the mouse to check around the, the, these various areas. There is this one, there's a hallway that they, basically, buildings on each side, you can place assassins up on the roofs and you can build barricades down the street and place assassins behind the barricades as well. Enemies are going to come with different men. You have different assassin types, you have to defeat them, and, you know, it's obvious one type of enemy is going to be really effective against one type of assassin, and vice versa, and all that kind of deal. And, typically, they'll also attack with a siege weapon, which is really cool. And, I didn't play enough of them to be able to tell for sure. Well, eventually, I'm sure they run out of new units, but for the first several fights, you know, you can certainly do like four or five or so of these then defenses. And by the way, winning, of course, means that you get to keep the, the den, and losing means that they get, you know, the, the captain, you know, takes it back over, and then you have to kill the captain, light the thing, and yeah. Anyway, yes, for the, for the first while, there's a new, you know, new, new enemy troops and new, typically winning gets you one or two new things, you know, maybe it gets you a new type of barricade, which is also really cool. The first barricade is just a wall, but when you break an enemy siege weapon, I guess they just kind of, you know, piece it together as a barricade, and yeah, you know, suddenly you have a barricade which can actually fire stuff. 
It's pretty cool. This game is a bit on the short side, you know, compared to some of the others. 29 and a half hours is what it took me to complete this and get it to 98% synchronization, which is where it's at now, as I record this. And, you know, the, the similar number for Brotherhood, although I think that's for 100% synchronization, is excuse me, 64 and a half hours. Which, you know, I'd say 25 to 30 hours of that is, you know, me actually completing the game, 20, you know, and similarly 25 to 30 hours of that is just going around collecting stuff, you know, making sure I renovate everything and such. And in this, I'd say only a third of the time, you know, only a third of those almost 30 hours is just going around and doing stuff, and the rest is just me completing the game. There's much less extra stuff to do, you know, there's really just the story campaign, which, as you probably can figure out, you're not really going to be replaying, except, you know, if you want to get 100% sync or something. But, yeah, other than that, there's, there's very little to stick around with in the single-player portion of the game. And a lot of the things that you do get to do are really, really easy and kind of boring. I mean, there, there's... You have these book quests where you, you know, find a book and basically you just climb to the top of a building, use your, it's not, it's no longer eagle vision, it's not eagle sense, and you, you know, hover the mouse over a couple of different areas until you find the right one, then you go to that area, hold shift down, you know, like you're looting, and that's it! That literally is the whole, in Brotherhood you were looting entire tombs, you know, this, yeah. This just has much less content. I don't know, I don't know if it's like rushed or, but yeah, it, it really has like the feel of an expansion pack rather than a full game. The, I'm not going to give away all the new action set pieces, but something that happens fairly early on, you again get to, you know, ride these, what's it called, horse, horse drawn carriages, and now it has this Ben-Hur kind of thing to it, where you're, you know, like, bumping into other horse-drawn characters and trying to, you know, destroy them by that, you know, it's, it's pretty cool. And you are drawn by the end of a, a rope at, you know, behind the, the horse-drawn carriage and sliding side to side trying to avoid, you know, getting hit by rocks to, you know, maintain enough health to get through the, the whole thing. It's quite cool. The, the overall story is, again, quite good, you know, engaging, some nice twists in there. The, there are a couple of new features which are really nice. I guess I should just get the hook blade out of the way. It really doesn't do very much. It, the best thing about it is it gives you some more sort of evasive maneuvers. Basically, you can run at an enemy, and if you hold down shift, you can either, well, basically, you can jump over him using the hook to, like, attach yourself to him, and you can, and depending on if you just press it or if you hold it down, you'll also, like, throw him, which is pretty cool. And, you know, be before, if, if they stood on, in a line and prevented you from going, there was nothing you could do, now you can actually run back, which I guess is also kind of, again, streamlining, you know, taking away consequence, so, yeah. Other than that, it basically just amounts to allowing you to zip line, because Ubisoft can't stop making Splinter Cell games for more than a couple of years, you know, even, even if they're not, uh, I guess this is one game where it actually makes a little bit of sense, you are still an assassin, you know, it, it was... It was worse when they did it with Prince of Persia, because that just made, made no sense at all. Now, other than that, you get to... You know, where, where before we had smoke bombs, now you can craft your own bombs, which is really cool. And before I get into the details of that, just so I don't forget, now you actually have something that this should have had from the very beginning, alternate fire. Basically, pretty much everything that you throw is now on the E key, you know, and, you know, the eagle 
vision, now eagle sense, which by the way, when you enter it, you hear these noises that sound kind of like someone is having trouble with their stomach, which I guess, you know, considering Ezio's age, I guess it's, you know, only, it's, it, we, we just expect that kind of thing from him by now. And by the way, it also allows you to like see tracks and something really nice, it allows you to see these basically paths that the, what's it called, the patrols, guard patrols use, which, you know, makes it a lot easier, you know, do an ambush or, yeah. And basically the alternate fire, yes, every, everything that you fire, everything that you shoot, except for the crossbow, that one is still on the left mouse button. And yes, that does mean that you can kind of dual wield which I just think is, is so, so very, very cool. You know, you, you can literally be firing, you know, within a second or two, the, the gun, the hidden gun, and the crossbow, you know, without, without actually changing weapons. Although, you know, it does have the animation of him, you know, he'll like put away the crossbow while you're firing a gun or something like that. But yeah, you know, you don't have to go into the, the weapon wheel, you know, anyway. Also, for anything that you throw that is like a bomb, finally, we get a throwing system. You know, I don't know why it took them so long to do this. We, you know, Splinter Cell had a throwing system, and a great one, right from the start. And by the way, this is a pretty good throwing system. It's, it's quite good. It will, you know, basically project visually where exactly you're what you, you know, the, the bomb is going to land and how wide the area of effect is, even highlighting enemies that will be affected by it. And if you just hold down the button and there's a specific guard, it'll go directly to that, which is one bit of streamlining that I don't mind so much, although I do wish that it would go away from it faster, because sometimes that you aren't trying to shoot at that guard. But anyway, the... Bomb crafting has a lot of potential in there. Basically, there are different shells, different gunpowders, and different effects. And you can carry you can carry four or five, depending on if you've completed the challenge that allows you to carry five, which is really nice. I like that you can't carry more than that, although Unfortunately, you can recharge anywhere you are, and anywhere you are, and you know, just by going into the you know, marking that bomb and pressing space key. And you, if you have the ingredients, you can make more. So, yeah, I really wish that this game would start. Th this game series would start actually having consequences. Anyway, and you can change what you're carrying in the bomb crafting stations, which are all over the place. Even some even in some missions, so it's not like, you know, oh, I have to go on a long mission, oh, long mission, not this game series, I, you know, really have to think about what I'm going to need most, yeah, none of that, anyway, you have three different pouches, lethal, tactical, diversionary, lethal is obvious, diversionary, it's basically, you know, one of the things you can make first, basically everything that is in there, as the title alludes to, is something that distracts, you know, there is, you know, and, and it's different ways of distracting the, the enemy, basically, you know, one is this, this smoke, which makes them think that someone set fire to something, so they go to investigate, but only if they see it. Then there is, it's actually called Cherry Bomb, you know, which, yeah, it makes a loud noise, and they go to investigate, that one's you know, a bit easier. You can throw that behind guards and they'll, you know, still notice it. And, you know, yeah, stuff like that. And the tactical, that's where you have the smoke bomb, which now is just this wall of smoke, which is really cool. You actually have to use the eagle sense to see your enemies while you're using it. You literally are just ninjaing it, you know, you're just using the smoke and you're killing all these guys and you, you can basically be gone by the time. It, it is really useful for escaping. You know, if you don't want to fight some guards, you can just throw one down at your feet and just, you know, walk away, run away, and yeah, they, they may not actually be able to catch up to you. And 
you know, and the, the thing of, you can still throw money, and now there is this bomb which explodes into fake money, which basically makes any civilians that find them very aggressive towards governments in that area, because they're like, no, it's my money, you know, and yeah, it's, it's pretty cool. That's a good tactic for escaping or for, you know, evening out the odds. Say you're fighting 10 guys, you're like, hey, you know, no, not today. You throw that, you know, several of them are going to be, you know, restrained by these civilians. And it's not like the guards are just going to kill random civilians just because they're being, you know, annoying. So, yeah. But yeah, so you have these various ones. I forgot to expand on the shells. The gunpowder is basically just how wide an area of effect it is, and yeah, it basically is, you know, if, let's say you're, you're using a lethal bomb, you know, and you want to use it on guards, but there are civilians around, you might think, well, I, you know, and still, you can kill civilians. This is why, th this, this could easily have been the first game where you could kill civilians, because now it actually makes sense, you know, you accidentally stabbing civilians, that is just a pain in the ass, you know, it has been in all the other games. This one, I think they actually made it worse. Anyway, yeah, you know, you can throw the, you know, this bomb and you might not want it to affect that big area. So you're thinking, okay, you know, use that gunpowder or you're going up against only guards, you want to kill a bunch of them, you use the most powerful gunpowder. And obviously all of this also depends on how much you have of these various ingredients, which are found all over the place. Although some of them, some of the more cool ones, are a bit more limited, which I think was a really good decision. The shells, basically you have this one, the, the basic one which just, you know, breaks instantly and has an immediate effect. Then you have this which is on a timer and bounces, and when you pull down the, when you use the throwing system, it'll actually show you, it will bounce to here, you know, let's say you're aiming at a wall, it'll say, well, and then it'll bounce down and, you know, go a little further, and it has like a three or five second fuse, something like that. Then we get to the really badass ones. Tripwire. Yes, you can make it, and, and remember, you can use this on all the various ones, you know, it can be a lethal bomb, it can be, you know, a bomb that, by the way, some of the ingredients make the targets hit by them more susceptible to attack. Like, there, there's one that has lamb's blood in it, and when, you know, when the, the victim finds that, oh my god, there's blood on it, you know, he's gonna think he's already wounded, and, you know, he's gonna, yeah, like panic, basically. But anyway, yeah, you know, you can use the tripwire to anything, and with being able to see where the patrols go, yeah, you know, you can actually plant one where a patrol will walk to, you know. Really do wish that it was easier to keep the civilians from walking into them, because they, of course, affect them as well, but yeah. And finally, the sticky shell, which... You can attach to anything that you throw it onto, including enemies, which is just freaking awesome. You know, I, you can throw it into an, an enemy group and it'll attach to just one of them and they'll keep walking. He, he's not going to notice it, you know, and suddenly it just explodes and it doesn't even attract attention to you necessarily. Yeah, you know. Nothing has particularly changed in this as far as hiring groups and all that stuff. You know, they're still mercenaries, still thieves. Sex workers, or courtesans, are now Romanis, which makes a lot of sense considering the location. I think that pretty much covers single player, so multiplayer. It changes a few basic things, but other than that, it's more or less the same, which is good. You know, there are a few new game modes, though, and several new maps. I don't know, five or six new maps, and all of the original ones, as far as I can tell, as well as all the original abilities and perks, pretty much. I think there's like one or two here and there. Some of them have been combined, at least. I noticed Sprint Boost is not there anymore, which I can kind of understand why. It was not that useful of ability, you know. If they had removed Poison, I would be picketing Ubisoft right now. Anyway, the changes are pretty much the compass 
has been sort of has has gotten this extra attribute where you know the, it doesn't only light up when there is this you know pro pro when when you can basically see them when they're in within your line of sight from where you are. Now it also brightens this you know bluish light as you approach. It's like a low jack meter, you know, and this really really helps in some things. Also, you're given a compass for some things where you didn't have them before. Escort and I think also chest capture, you know, stuff like that, where it's really really useful to actually be able to gradually zero in on. You know, I mean, escort. It it evens it out quite a bit. You know, it it makes it a lot tougher to actually sneak up on VIPs because of this. You know, also we get a mode which, you know, the, the mode deathmatch has no regular compass, only the you know low jackmeter thing, and there there is also a, a variant of it which is called simple deathmatch where you have no abilities whatsoever nor perks or anything so it's just you know yeah straight up fighting or yeah you know. it still has the you know you're either an assassin or a pursuer or you might be both but you will you know you can't kill your pursuer for example you can only stun them and you can't stun your target I don't know why you want to but anyway you can't now deathmatch is basically no one, you know, there, there are no duplicates of the player characters. If, you know, if you have, you have a target and once you see someone who looks like that target, unless they like morphed or something, that's your target, you know. So, yeah, it, it has that intensity to it. Other than that, we have, we have Artifact Assault, which is basically the capture the flag, and it has this... You know, basically, if you are on the side of, on your side, it's very, very distinctly marked. There's this wall, which is red for the, you know, the opposing side and white for the regular one. And even when you pass through it, you will be told, the animus voice will tell you, you are now a target, you are now a pursuer. You know, in your own area, you're a pursuer, meaning anyone who reaches your area, you know, your half, which they have to do to get the flag or the artifact, they can't kill you, but they can stun you, and you can kill them, you know, or and be stunned by them, and vice versa. If you, you know, once you have the enemy flag, you are definitively a pursuer, though I think you might be able to kill the opposing flag bearer, but I haven't quite gotten in that situation. And other than that, you know, and you can always kill the flag bearer of the enemy team, even if you are on their side, which, you know, really makes things a much, you know, much better. There is this thing called corruption, where basically, you know, in multiplayer, just regularly, you can play as Vlad Dracula, you know, he's there, he's a playable character. In corruption, some of the players start as him, and they are corrupted, and they have to kill the uncorrupted, while the uncorrupted have to hide. Kill a corrupted, he'll kill it uncorrupted, he will be corrupted. You know, it's nice and simple. And there are a couple of excuse me, there are a couple of rounds. And I think it switches around so that everyone gets to start as both corrupted and uncorrupted. And you're given points by as corrupted how quickly you kill the enemies, and as uncorrupted how long you survive as uncorrupted. The yeah, there, there are a couple of other game modes, and yeah, most, most of them are quite good. This evens out the relationship between Pursuer and Target much, with more... It's easier to stun, and you have a wider sort of, you know, yeah, you, you have a bigger chance of stunning the enemy. And something that I... I think we can all really appreciate that they added is the honorable death slash contested kill feature, which basically means that if you are pursued and you just for whatever reason um, you you face your opponent and press the shift key, you know where in Brotherhood if if he's already killing you, it's not gonna stun. Now it 
earns you an honorable death, which gives you 100 points and means contested kill for the pursuer, which lessens his score. So, you know, it really matters if you sneak up on someone and, or if your target actually discovers you, you know. And you can even do that. I've seen people who do this from a, a, a bale of hay, you know, or a haystack, that's what it's called. You know, yeah, would be really difficult to hide in just a hay bale. Anyway, yeah, you know, so th there's a lot of chances for that. The... Also, it now, where before you started at incognito, incognito, now you start at discreet, and once your target is within your sight, then walking slowly is going to slowly increase it up to incognito. So if you actually get an incognito, you work for it this time, you know. That feature, that, that change, I'm a little half and half on, but to be fair, now they've done both, you know, if you really don't like that feature, and if you thought that the relationship between pursuer and pursued target was, you know, was better before or fine before, Brotherhood's still there to play, you know. The support is much better. It's much easier to actually find a match, you know. I've, I've been playing both Brotherhood and Revelations in multiplayer over these, you know, I don't know over a month or so, and Sometimes I can barely even find a match in Brotherhood. I can always find one in Revelations if there is one. And it actually tells you, you know, when you go and say, well, I want this kind of match. It says, you know, low activity, medium activity, high activity. And, you know, it automatically kind of goes through the, you know, various matches. You know, if, if it's looking for a session and it, you know, it finds a session which is basically empty. It's not actually going to stick with that one, unlike Brotherhood. It's actually going to say, you know what, this is going nowhere. Let's find another one. You know, and when you, you know, the, the filters is much, the, the filtering system is much better, where before you basically had to say, well, I want this exact time of match, or I don't care, just pick one. Now you can actually say, well, I want something that's, you know, team-based, or I want... Uh, you know, free for all, these various things, you know. There is a lot more to sort of get in multiplayer, you know, customization is now through the roof. And they have this really smart system with Abstergo credits, you know, where you have to pay for everything, including abilities. Sure, they get unlocked by the level you're on, but before you use them, you have to buy them. And you earn Abstergo credits by doing well in the matches. So, yeah, you and, and Abstergo credits can also be used on these various customization things. Every player can make an emblem, and there is a massive, you know, there, there are a lot of opportunities for really customizing this logo. And regardless of which player character you use, it's going to appear somewhere on them, you know, and don't worry, it also appears on the, you know, duplicates in the, in the level, you know, it's not, it doesn't make it extremely obvious who's, you know, a duplicate and who's a player character. And, you know, player characters can also be customized very nicely with several different options. You can actually give them different weapons now, I mean, not just, you know, completely freely, but you can basically choose what the weapon looks like, and in some instances, what weapon it is. You know, there's a taunting system, which is really nice. The, by the way, the observer credits, something they're also used for is ability crafting. I'm slightly torn on this, but basically, this it's a system that allows you to... There, there are these uh, attributes. To all the abilities, you know, how their range, their duration, and their cooldown is the sort of basic, you know, so, some of them it's different, but yeah, let's just go with that. That, all, those three attributes have these two, you know, you, you can improve all of them by two, or by one, depending on what you want, but you only have two points total, so you know, what do you want? Do you want to increase one thing twice? Do you want to increase two of them by one each? And if so, which ones, you know, and, you know, 
yeah, this allows you to make some abilities, you know, much more useful in various ways. And now what this is, is when you do that, when you craft an ability, it applies to all of them. You know, if you have the same ability in two ability sets, it applies to both. There is no, and, and if you want it changed to something else, you have to craft that ability again, and you're going to lose the, you know, the other crafting. And this does kind of take away from, you know, in Brotherhood multiplayer, it's a lot of fun to complete challenges to unlock these evolved abilities, and you can pick and choose, you know, do I want my knives to slow down the enemy for a long time, or slow him down by a lot for a shorter time, you know, these various things. I don't know. Again, I like that they did something different, at least. And for some of them it is really cool, because you do really have to, it's finally consequence, you know, again, you want consequence in the Assassin's Creed game, you gotta go into multiplayer. I don't know why they insist on keeping it only to there. The basic stupidity of, you know, the, the I don't know, the, the programming, I guess, has worsened. It, you know, it will literally kill the wrong target, even when, even when you've marked a target, if it's just facing slightly off, I guess, or some, sometimes I really can't figure out why it kills the wrong one, and you lose the contract, you might get stunned, really frustrating. You can now stun at pretty much any time, and you can accidentally stun civilians, and it's not going to lose you a contract, you know, so yeah. But, if you do it when someone is looking, you know, if you stun the wrong person, then yeah, oops, you know, like I said, evening out, you know, for better or for worse, the relationship between pursuer and target. I suppose that more or less covers it. One thing to note is that a few of the, it's a minor thing, it's a nitpick, but some of the characters in multiplayer, playable characters, look an awful lot like the ones from Brotherhood, and in these new settings, they look kind of weird. You know, they, the, the, the Doctor is back, for example, and it just looks wrong. And the Knight as well, you know, because all of the new ones are, you know, you've got like, I think one of them is like a, a slave, an African-American, I don't not African, African something, please don't hunt me down and kill me. And, you know, you've got a thespian who has this really cool dagger, you know, various ones. Like I said, Black Dracula. There's a pirate. Yeah, there's, yeah. Actually, I think there's two. There's a male and a female pirate. And, yeah, various ones. The... I should talk a little bit about the new... One thing, you know, there, there are some of the perks and kill streaks or lose lost streaks, there are these things called animus hacks. And you know, basically they allow you to kill anyone you target from excuse me, from a distance. Instant well not instantly, but without having to focus like with the gun, you know. And yeah, it's it's pretty cool. And you can even do focus kills with them, if you just, you know, let... It. If they don't leave your view and the, the circle fails, you get a focus kill for it. Now, the new thing... I think it's... well, actually, there are a couple of new abilities. There's this one called the Bodyguard, which is really cool. It, it doesn't replace the decoy. I, I was slightly surprised to find that, but basically... It morphs a nearby civilian, if he does not really look like you, into your duplicate. And he's gonna go, you know, it takes like a second or so to activate, and then he's gonna go and stun the nearest pursuer, and only one pursuer. And yeah, you know, and sometimes your enemy will kill the, the pursuer, and then he's right for the stunning. Or he'll stun one pursuer, and then the other pursuers will wail on that guy, and then you can run away in the in the chaos. It's pretty cool. And then there's this thing called the tripwire, which yeah, it's a it's a tripwire mine, and again doesn't replace the smoke bomb, although it has a very similar effect. 
It also sometimes seems to have the effect of the firecrackers, which are all also gone back, back not gone. In, in that it, in multiplayer, it can only be affected by a pursuer or a target. It can't be affected by the civilians. So you know, playing manhunt, hiding out, you can throw one in front of you and just wait for someone to activate it, and then you'll know. You know, you may not know exactly who the which one of them is the pursuer in case you want to stun them, but at least you can run away if you know if nothing else. And it can also be used, you know, offensively, offensively. Yeah, it's it's not actually uh, that offensive to, to have a tripwire thrown at your at your feet. I think that pretty much covers it. So yeah, if there's any aspect of the game you feel I didn't cover here, just you know, ask me down below. I've reviewed other parts of this series. The links are in the description box. Please rate and comment. And hey, if you like this video, that subscribe button's just waiting for you to click it.